Yes, Hello, my name is Raul Pangalangan. I am a professor of law at the University of the Philippines, and I was a Philippine delegate to the Rome Conference that drafted the statute for the International Criminal Court. My focus is on the phenomenon of non-international armed conflicts. We have developed international law doctrines and approaches to protect human dignity during armed conflict, to ensure peace, and should we fail, to temper the human costs of strife. These entire bodies of law have been directed, however, at international armed conflict, wars between states, and the resulting legal regimes have treated non-international armed conflict as the exception, as the aberration. And the discipline of public international law is able to accommodate the phenomenon of non-international conflict by abdicating on the debate on substance and shifting to the debate on process. I will begin by going back to the basics, identifying the basic rules, and then demonstrating how the phenom phenomenon of internal armed conflicts strains these rules. And I ask how international law has or can creatively address these tensions. There are three overlapping regimes. The first deals with the prohibition on the use of force and the prohibition on intervention in the domestic jurisdiction of states. Both rules contained in Article 2, Paragraph 4 and Article 2, Paragraph 7, respectively, of the UN Charter. And it is these rules that provide us the structural scaffolding that divide the phenomena from the international to the non-international and reserves non-international armed conflicts to the regulation solely by the sovereign states and immunizes these states from international regulation. The second is international humanitarian law, which to its credit actually comes to terms with the fact that there is such a thing as non-international armed conflicts. And it is in fact part of our discussion to ask how IHL was able to achieve that without disturbing, without displacing the rest of the scaffolding of public international law. And the third is international human rights law, which again attempts to regulate aspects of international strife, but this time by shifting, by, by shifting to the individual rather than to collectivities or groups. Note that the norm on the use of force, deliberately and by design, does not prescribe the use of force against domestic rebels. The ban applies rather to the international use of force by one state against another. And within each state, the sovereign reigns supreme and holds what has been called the monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Normatively, therefore, the prohibition on the use of force, when it is applied to the phenomenon of internal armed conflict, provides a one-sided and asymmetrical burden. It is legitimate for one side, the government, and illegitimate for the other, the rebel. Precisely for this reason, internal conflict doesn't fit the dominant paradigm of international humanitarian law. I must at the outset recognize that the 1949 Geneva Conventions actually took the path-breaking step of recognizing that non-international armed conflicts can be regulated and did so through common Article 3. But within the larger context of the framework of IHL, what we see is a body of law that has flourished precisely by shifting away from the hues ad bellum, the law governing the causes of war, to the hues in bello, the law governing the conduct of hostilities. It abandons the old dilemma of how to determine what is a just war, whose cause is superior, 
but aims rather merely to determine the outer constraints on the allowable violence, whether it is through the principle of distinction between combatants and non-combatants, or the principle of proportionality, as between the violence used and the military objectives sought to be achieved, and it stays aloof of the just war debate altogether. And yet notice that for internal armed conflict, the state actually retains the just cause advantage. It presumptively acts in behalf of its people, the bearer of the mantle of self-determination, so to speak, and indeed the rebels remain invisible to international law because they remain within the sovereignty and domestic jurisdiction of states and are in fact condemned typically as criminals under national law because they are outlaws and punishable under national law. Finally, shifting to international human rights law, there is actually a reverse asymmetry. While both the state and the rebels are parties to the internal armed conflict, only the state assumes obligations under human rights treaties. The rebel groups are not eligible in the first place to be parties to these instruments, and the obligation to respect and to promote human rights therefore imposes an asymmetrical burden upon the state, but not upon the insurgent group. We have thus far examined the different ways by which the phenomenon of non-international armed conflict strains the framework of public international law. What we will now proceed to do is to look at the more specific ways by which developments in this field have actually strained this framework and how we propose to reconcile that framework with these developments. The first problem is that international law actually provides normative ammunition to revive a just war approach to internal armed conflicts. To start with, that was the criticism against Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions. At the outset, when it internationalized wars of national liberation, anti-colonial and anti-apartheid struggles, and extended to them the full application of international humanitarian law. It privileges self-determination as a justification for the use of force. And hence, the exceptions to the ban on the use of force and the cryptic clause about the use of force, in quotation marks, in any manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Close quote. It revives as well the just war logic for the state in that public international law gives primacy to the protection of territorial integrity and condemns repeatedly in various instruments all attempts at secession. PIL, public international law, therefore poses virtually insurmountable odds against any group that aims to secure for itself territory erstwhile belonging to the sovereignty of another. Even in the most authoritative reaffirmation of the principle of self-determination, it is explicitly stated that nothing in that instrument can be construed as authorizing or encouraging anything that would dismember, impair, or impair the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. Notice, therefore, that the logic of the inherent right to self-defense, which rests upon the, the, the classic principles of self-help, can very well extend to the power of the sovereign to defend itself against any attempt at, um, at dismemberment and thus further strengthen the hand of the state as against rebels. The second specific challenge pertains to the status of the parties. Notice that under human rights law, we encountered the asymmetrical nature of the obligations. Obligations that devolve upon the state, but not upon the rebel group. Humanitarian law actually neutralizes that inequality. It enables a party to be bound 
by virtue solely of being a party to the armed conflict and indifferent to the question of whether it is a state or a non-state actor. Precisely for that purpose, therefore, the application of international humanitarian law to a non-international armed conflict does not affect the status of the parties. This is formally recognized in the relevant instruments. Common Article 3, for instance, says that nothing in the, um, in the provisions shall affect the status of the parties to the conflict, and this is formalized even further in Protocol 2 to the Geneva Conventions, which says that nothing in the protocol shall be invoked for the purpose of affecting the sovereignty of the state and the responsibility of the government to maintain or to re-establish itself. This also brings us to the confusion about the status of the belligerent, an excuse used by governments to refuse to extend inter international humanitarian law to rebels on the assumption that they will thus be deemed to have accepted the legal personality of the rebel group by way of extending to international law the equitable principle of estoppel that we find in municipal law. This confusion should actually be easily avoided. By looking at the history of the doctrine, the notion of the belligerent was developed in contrast to the notion of the neutral party to an armed conflict, to a war. And it establishes the immunities of the neutral as between the two belligerent parties. The notion, therefore, was not developed for the purpose of determining which entity, which party should be considered an international person for the purpose of applying international humanitarian law. The third specific challenge pertains to the so-called gap between human rights law and humanitarian law that twilight zone at which neither body of law is applicable, thus leaving the victims of internal armed conflict bereft of the protection of international law and therefore at the mercy of national law, and that is to say beyond the reach of international law rules that provide both the legal and rhetorical framework for regulating armed strife and insinuating arms, internal armed strife even more deeply into the normative framework that excludes, vilifies, and criminalizes the rebel. The argument by now is familiar. Human rights law, and to be more specific, um, in the International Covenant on Civil and, and Political Rights, contains a derogation clause which allows states to suspend certain human rights under states of emergency, including the rights most threatened in internal armed conflicts, the right against arbitrary arrest and detention, the freedom of movement, and the right to leave and to return to one's own country. On the other hand, when it comes to the question of the status of the parties, recent developments in international law actually provide certain complications. We have encountered the notion of subnational self-determination or internal self-determination. We have all also seen the protection of the human rights of non-state actors, be they ethnic minorities under civil and political rights or of indigenous peoples under separate conventions. And it is the emergence of non-state actors that enable groups, eventually rebel groups, to assert separate claims under international law, under a different rubric, under a different personality. The third specific challenge posed by non-international armed conflicts arises from the so-called gap the gap at which neither human rights law nor humanitarian law will apply. Leaving the victims of internal armed conflict bereft of the protection of international law, totally at the mercy of national law, and in fact insinuated more, even more deeply into a normative framework in national law that excludes, vilifies, and criminalizes the rebel.
The argument by now is familiar. Human rights law, to be more specific, the inter International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, contains a derogation clause which allows states to suspend certain human rights under states of emergency. On the other hand, international humanitarian law is triggered off only when an armed conflict exists, and not, for instance, to use the language of Protocol 2, in cases of mere internal disturbances and tensions, such as riots, isolated, and sporadic acts of violence. This is more than just a question of what specific rights are at stake in the derogation clause. It is more a question of, at any stage, enabling an international authority to enforce the accountability of a state. In other words, in that gap, the state is therefore, the sovereign state uh, is therefore completely at liberty to deal with the rebels solely under national law without being answerable to any larger international authority. One solution is to lower the threshold at which we can trigger off the application of humanitarian law. But when we try to do that, we run up against constraints which exist in the other field of law that we discussed earlier, namely the regulation of the use of force. Article 2, paragraph 4, governs only such armed conflicts that rise to the level of a threat to or a breach of international peace. That is to say, conflicts that cause a spillover onto the borders of other states. In this sense, Article 2, Paragraph 4 actually maintains the old settled rules requiring a geo-military threshold at which a rebel group calls international laws bluff and demands that it have a seat certainly a smaller, lower seat, but still at the sovereign's table. In other words, the Article 2, Paragraph 4 regime actually fosters and rewards political and military success, a legal framework where the norm actually and merely ratifies the facts. This actually brings us to the quintessential dilemma for the international regulation of internal strife. The three relevant fields of law, the use of force, human rights, and humanitarian law, actually adopt different approaches to the phenomenon. For international humanitarian law, there is actually a washing of hands on the legality of the recourse to armed force. It limits itself to the use in Bello, to govern the um, conduct of hostilities. It avoids passing judgment over the legality of the causes of the war. And in so doing, enables itself to broaden the scope of its application. 